Hi there, my name is Vic Vier. I'm an ENT surgeon working for the NHS in central London. And today I want to talk to you about the risks of having a bleed after a tonsillectomy. Now, the reason I want to make this video is because there's an awful lot of confusing information out there about which technique causes the least amount of bleeding or the least number of risks after the operation. Most of this video will be based on a very large study that was done called the National Prospective Tonsillectomy Audit. It is by far the biggest study ever done anywhere about tonsillectomy bleeds. And the major headline news from this audit was that the hotter the technique technique you used, the more bleeding there was afterwards. But that statement takes a little bit of time to unpick and I'll try and explain it to you as we go through. And the first thing you need to do is try and understand the different types of tonsillectomy operation. The traditional technique was to hold onto the tonsils, use some scissors and just cut them out and then just pack them, put some sort of sterile gauze in that area and wait for the bleeding to stop that way. So the next step up is that you pull out the tonsils cut them out and then cauterize the bleeding spots either with monopolar or bipolar uh, cauterization to stop the bleeding that way. The next step up from that is to hold the tonsils rather than using scissors to cut it out you use bipolar or monopolar to dissect it out with these cauterization techniques so there's even less blood being spilt at the time. The last technique I want to tell you about is coblation. But what you do is when you pass the energy it passes through an ionic sort of fluid so basically salt water and as it comes out the energy goes through that ionic field. What the National audit did was they looked at all the tonsillectomies, all the different ways that people were doing it. And then they looked back and tried to work out which technique caused the most bleeding afterwards. Now, it's a little bit more complicated than that because there are two different types of bleeding. There's bleeding that occurs on the first 24 hours after the operation, which we would call primary bleeding. The other type of bleeding is known as secondary bleeding. That tends to occur roughly about seven days after the operation, between sort of five and 10 days after the operation is, is when secondary bleeding occurs. And it could be due to lots of different things. So we believe it's due to infections and, and just areas of the uh, throat opening up and bleeding occurring that way. But also secondary bleeding is a little bit more complicated than that because a lot of people bleed after a tonsil operation. They bleed, about 30% of people do have uh, some blood. They spit up some blood a few days later, but then nothing else happens. Uh, and so that's very common. And some people end up coming to A&E because they're really worried. And some of the A&E staff would say to them, well, you stop bleeding now, you might as well just go home. Or some people will be very concerned and say, we'll stay in overnight. And so the vast majority of people, when they do stay in all, all night, they go home the next day. So there's a bit of variance there. So we don't really know whether if they stayed at home, they, everything would have been fine. So it all got very hotly debated and everyone discussed it. So most people now use a rather hard endpoint to try and compare like for like. So we now use a, if you go back to theatre after your tonsil operation, then that's a significant bleed. And we use this back to theatre bleed rate as a, as a harder, more precise form of working out whether the patients had a significant bleed or not. So what I'm gonna show you now is a table that I've taken directly from the document. And you can see this table shows the primary bleeds and the secondary bleeds. And on the side, they talk about all the different ways of uh, the different surgical techniques. Now you can pause the video here and have a look at it, but I'll move this other way so I can stop bleeding to one side. And I guess it's slightly confusing and I'll try and put something over here for you. So it shows that if you use bipolar cauterization, you have the lowest risk of bleeding in the first 24 hours. And that's that discrete, uh, those two little electrodes with energy passing between them. And the highest risk of bleeding is if you use coblation or, or no cauterization at all, which sort of makes sense. Coblation is sort of low energy, low thermal energy, and also it's all more spread out because it's in this ionic field. And if you don't cauterize anything, then it's, you're more likely to bleed because you're just putting packing there and waiting for it to stop naturally. You'll see also that monopolar is slightly higher because I think it just sort of sprays out everywhere. It doesn't really target the blood vessel that you're trying to stop bleeding. So that's why I think bipolar has the lowest risk of primary bleeding rates. But what is interesting is when you get to the secondary bleed rates. So actually the lowest risk of bleeding as a secondary bleed rate or back to theatre rate, is that if you use one of the cold steel methods, either you take the tonsils, remove the scissors, put packing in there, and just wait for it to stop bleeding naturally, or use monopolar or bipolar. The risk suddenly jumps up if you're using the bipolar, monopolar, or coblation techniques to cauterize everything as you take out these tonsils. So on the back of this information, the National Prospective Tonsillectomy Audit said to everyone, look, the less energy is delivered to the, uh, when you do this operation, the less bleeding you'll get, particularly seven days down the road. Now, there are lots of boring debates since then because a lot of people worried about coblation, said, well, I think coblation is better and all this sort of thing. And a lot of people pointed to the fact that they thought that coblation caused less pain afterwards. And because of this, the Cochrane database, which is probably the most respected sort of team that deal with these sorts of things, looked at the pain results 
after coblation and other techniques. And back in, I think, 2017, they did a review and they found that actually there may be a slight difference on day one after using coblation surgery, but as the days went on, there's very little difference after day one. But if you looked at the National Prospective Tonsillectomy Audit, you'll see that the bleed rates are much higher with coablation. On saying that, however, there is a different technique where I think coablation is really, really useful. It's not when you're removing the tonsils in their entirety, it's when you're using an intracapsular technique where you're not removing all the tonsils, you're just reducing the volume of the tonsils. You're leaving tonsil behind. You're just getting down close to it. So you just, the tonsil is like this and you've reduced it down to there. There's still a layer of tonsil there so you're not, um, you're not exposing these nerves to the outside world. There is actually a video where I talk about the different techniques of use for tonsillectomy, and I'll leave that there for you. There were a couple of other things that were mentioned in the National Tonsillectomy Audit. One was the fact that the more experienced the surgeon was, the less chance of bleeding uh, at the time of the operation or the primary bleeds and also the secondary bleeds. Now that makes complete sense and it might explain why there's a slight difference between NHS hospitals and private hospitals. I don't think it's because uh, the, the private hospitals are somehow better. It's just that most of those operations are done by consultants, whereas on the NHS, most tonsillectomy operations are done by junior doctors. And it's important to say that uh, we do, as consultants, need to teach junior doctors how to perform this operation because once I've retired in a few years' time, well, then who else is going to be doing these operations? So we do need to train people. But what the National Audit said was that you shouldn't just leave these doctors to do their operations and just, you know, just walk out the theatre, let them do their thing. You should be always there making sure they're doing the right thing, watching how they do their operations to try and keep the risks, the complications and the bleed rate as low as possible. There's also a little bit of data there that showed that the more infections and the more problems you had with your tonsils for a longer period of time, the greater the risk of bleeding afterwards. So for example, if you had just big tonsils, but you never had any infections, you hadn't had any pain in the back of your throat, then removing those tonsils, the risk is relatively low in terms of the back to theatre rate for those patients. But if you're constantly getting infections every two or three months, uh, maybe getting something known as a quinsy, which is infection around the back of the tonsil, in between the tonsil and the, and the side wall of your throat, those sorts of things led to increased levels of bleeding and back to theatre rates after the operation. And I think that's mainly because when you've had so many infections in the past, everything seems to get stuck down. Normally you can just hold on to tonsils and just sort of almost peel them out. And it's very easy, particularly in children, because they haven't had so many infections. But as you get older, you've had a longer period of time where you could get lots of these horrible infections. And that causes this scar tissue between the two. And it doesn't just peel out, it gets stuck. And you have to start digging into the areas which are very sensitive to get these tonsils out and that can lead to pain, infection and bleeding afterwards. I think the best thing about this audit was that when they released the information, everyone, there was lots of debates and everyone was, some people angry, some people very happy. But the point is that everyone looked at it and thought to themselves, well, actually, I should be really careful about the amount of energy I deliver to the tonsil bed because it seems to cause increased bleeding seven days later. And none of us want bad results at all. We want our patients to be healthy, happy, and get over their operations well. And because of this, everyone looked at their surgical technique and reduced the amount of energy performed. And nationwide, the levels of bleeding dropped down considerably. And although this happened before, we're very, very careful to scrutinize every single tonsillectomy operation. We look at the numbers of people who bled. We look at each and every person who bled after their operation. And we just check and just scrutinize every little thing to see if there's any way that we can improve our rates, see if there's something going wrong. I think it's made it so much safer for people out there. And, and uh, that's why the NHS is great. What I'm currently doing is writing a small ebook, which I hopefully I'll be giving away to all my subscribers to my newsletter. A lot of people, for example, worry about if I take out my tonsils, will it affect my immunity? And um, how can I reduce the rate of bleeding, which is what this video is all about. Click on that link and you'll be in my newsletter uh, and I'll send you that book as soon as it's made available. And hopefully you'll find that useful and uh, slightly less confusing <laughs> than this video. I think that's enough for me. Do take care. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.